Um, give me just one moment here. Okay. Great. Well, um, I'm going to start by introducing myself briefly and why we're here today. And then I'm going to pass it over um, for this uh, a tour and talk that we're being given. Um, so my name is Stoney Samso. I'm the director and co-founder of Open Air, which is a place-based artist in residence program that connects artists with unique sites around Western Montana. And we work collaboratively with many community partners to place artists in unique sites and um, host and engage our communities in conversations about uh, site-specific works um, and artwork that's being made in response to this. Um, excuse me, I'm also playing our uh, computer administrator here, so I'll periodically be letting people in. Um, I am thrilled today. We are going to be talking with Alice Hargrave and our friends over at Illinois State University about her exhibition, The Canary in the Lake. And we're accompanied uh, by our friends at Flathead Lake Biological Station. Tom Bansick is here. And so as we go along today, this is, uh, we invite you to have a dialogue together with us. And so um, you'll be able to ask Alice and Tanya and Catherine, and they're all going to be introduced here in momentarily, but you'll also be able to ask Tom questions maybe about the Flathead Lake Biological Station. Um, let's see, uh, I, I want to give thanks to uh, Alice Hargrave for being here and sharing uh, about her wonderful work with us. For um, Kendra Pyatt's who can't join us, she was the curator connected to this work and she had a meeting that came up. And so thank you so much, Tanya Scott, uh, who's a curator of education at Illinois State University. Um, and actually a native Montanan, wonderful crossover there. Um, thanks for, to her for kind of helping be the guide. Um, she's there on site um, at ISU galleries. Um, and then thanks to Catherine O'Reilly who is connected to this project as well. We'll learn more about her role and involvement as well as we go along. Um, and also, I just want to acknowledge a quick thanks to um, a few of our friends who are here uh, and are supporters of open air. Uh, we have our friends at Blackfoot Communications, Clearwater Credit Union, and Payne West Insurance. And then also a special thanks to our friends at Laura Barrett Living Arts Foundation for their generous support. Um, let's see. I'm going to run, touch on just a little housekeeping, and then I am going to turn it over to Tanya, and she's going to ground you in this wonderful exhibit. Um, so as I noted, this is being recorded. Um, and you all have your uh, microphones on mute. If you, we encourage you to participate in dialogue with us. So feel free to unmute yourself um, in the bottom left of your screen. Uh, or I will be uh, kind of surveying um, the uh, chat. And so if you uh, want to drop a question in there, I will keep an eye on that and make sure to chime in uh, on your behalf. Um, and then we are going to have, they're going to take us through the exhibit, but can ask them questions, and we'll also have time for Q&A at the end. Uh, I am exactly on time. Love it. Uh, Tanya, I'm going to pass it over to you and let you introduce yourself and the exhibit. Thank you so much, Stoney. Uh, so my name is Tanya Scott. Um, sorry, you can't see my face really. Uh, I am the curator of education here at University Galleries. Um, and um, yes, and Kendra does wish that she could be here. Um, and she's thinking of her spirit is with us. Uh, so um, I have been um, asked to, uh, to be here in her place. Um, so the title of this exhibition is The Canary in the Lake, which is in reference to um, the canary in the coal mine uh, of miners sending a canary in to check to see if a space was safe for humans. Um, and it's in reference to uh, freshwater lakes being sentinels for climate change and really kind of getting a sense of why, what might be coming, right, as these predictors. 
Um, and Alice and Catherine met each other at Alice Hargrave's 2017 exhibition here at University Galleries titled Paradise Wavering. And that exhibition was primarily focused on endangered and extinct bird species, um, where she worked similarly with these long fabric panels in some ways and photography obviously is her uh, medium, but uh, primary medium. Uh, and uh, so that uh, Catherine introduced herself to Alice after Alice's artist talk and um, was like, wow, this, this is really fantastic work. Wouldn't it be amazing if we could kind of build on this in, um, in relation to lakes around the world? And so they started talking about it and built this relationship and went to Gleon, which is the Global Lakes Ecological uh, organize, Organization Observatory, Observatory <laughs> Network, right? <laughs> yes, bunch of lake scientists. That come together and um, share what they've what they've been researching and their findings at this conference, um, and they got to attend and build relationships with these scientists from around the world, um, and collected data relating to what you see as twenty different lakes specifically in this exhibition, um, titled "The Conference of the Lakes," and the title is in reference to the twelfth century Persian mystic poem titled "The Conference of the Birds." which was written by Farid Attar. Um, and in this epic poem, uh, it's really an allegory for a spiritual journey. There's all these birds of the world come together and they go on a journey and uh, in search of truth or enlightenment. And they go on this search and many of them give up along the way. Some of them perish and a very select few of them make it to this mountain lake where they look into the lake and ask for the answer to their search. But instead of an answer, they see only their own reflections, which is referencing that the truth was inside of them all along. And so Alice has taken this poem as inspiration for this coming together, this conference of 20 lakes from around the world. So I will now uh, give the microphone over to Alice. Um, who will lead us in discussion. You may want to pin me, by the way, um, if you want to go up in your upper right-hand corner of, this, of my screen or your screen, one of the two, um, you get the option to pin the, the speaker. Um, but this way, it'll just stick on my video so that when Alice or Catherine or Stoney are talking, it won't skip to their screen and you'll be able to see the space. Is Alice still with us? Did we lose Alice? It does appear that way. Oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> Catherine, would you, this would be a good time if you want to kind of share, sure. introduce yourself. Sure, yeah, I am Catherine O'Reilly. I'm uh, a professor in the geology, geography and the environment department here at Illinois State University. And I've worked on lakes. That's my area of specialty. I'm really interested in lakes and climate change, the impacts of climate change on lakes. And I was really excited to be able to work with Alice because for a long time I've tr been trying to figure out a way to help the general public understand how unique and diverse each lake is. So I think hopefully you'll be able to see in this exhibition that you know one lake is not the same as another lake and the diversity of threats that lakes are exposed to. So I was also definitely like a little out of my comfort zone on this project too, right? Because I've I've never tried to work with an artist before, and um, so like how we figured out how to work together is bit of a work in progress, I think. It's been really fun though. Can, can you speak more to that, Catherine? What steps did y'all take? How did you begin to approach collaboration? I think one of the things that was, well, one, the COVID lockdown probably made it a little bit harder for us to engage with each other the way we wanted to, because we were doing everything by Zoom. Um, but we ended up setting up weekly meetings and um, sort of my role was sort of to, identify lakes and data and issues and you know interact with scientists to get their data and then do something with the data that Alice could then use to incorporate into the art um, and also sort of help Alice understand the issues at a deeper level 
to, so that she could think about what she wanted to portray as she put the pieces together. Um, and so, yes, yeah, so that was, you know, and then Alice would create these drafts and she would share them back with me and we'd have a discussion about what we liked and didn't like about them. So there's a lot of different, you know, each of the pieces she's used data in a slightly different way, color in a slightly different way. Um, and there's definitely an evolution over the course of our work together where we started with some things that were really just simple ways of thinking about how to portray the data to sort of lake portraits that are maybe more complex stories of, of the lake and its place in the landscape, as well as the data illustrating the issues that that lake is facing. So. Were you able to, uh, Stoney, have you received any information from Alice? Uh, she, she's she's gone black. I'm gonna um I'm gonna give her a call here. Uh, yeah. But you know, since we have oh Michelle, do you have a question? I see you waving your hand. Jump on in. Hi, uh, hi Catherine. I was, I was interested in what you were saying about the color and data being used in different ways for all the the fabric pieces, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you could talk. Uh, more about a, a piece that maybe stands out to you or maybe a favorite piece? Sure. Yes, I would love to because, you know, scientists, we all have our lake. And so even though it is not my lake, uh, um, maybe we, we could start with um, Lake Tanganyika, which was the first sort of piece that Alice and I really explored these ideas on before we even really knew we were going to do a project. Um, and it also sort of is a good starting point in the sense that it's relatively simple. So hopefully, so the fabrics that these are on, you can see that they're semi-transparent, right? So it's, um, Tanya's doing an excellent job of showing you both the transparency and the, the, the design on the fabric. And when Alice comes back in, I'll let her talk to you more about the decisions that she made about how to use this fabric and this particular fabric, because um, we didn't, this wasn't our original idea. But the, the data that you're seeing on there, or those wiggly lines that you're seeing on this are the data. These are data from Lake Tanganyika. Lake Tanganyika is a very large, unique lake in East Africa. And um, the data that are shown here are temperature data at different depths in the water column. And this is from data that a project that I've been involved in. And the issue that that lake is forming is it's warming up. And as the lake is warming up, it is uh, affecting the way the water mixes in the lake. And that's leading to decreased algal blooms and less food for fish. And so the millions of people that depend upon that lake for food are, are essentially losing a really important part of their, their protein source, really. So that was the very first one that Alice and I did. And the, the, um, I provided a graph of the data. She, she changed the colors um, of the data and chose a background color based on photographs that she had seen of the lake that I also supplied and other ones that she found on the internet. So that's that's kind of the, that's that was our starting point. Yeah. So. Thank, Tanya, thank you. And Alice, welcome back. Sorry about. Oh, I don't know what happened there, but I had a, uh, my laptop freaked out. And so I'm on my other machine now. So anyway, uh, I'm here. So sorry about that. That's not happened before to me. So mm -hmm. I don't know. Anyway, um, so did you get an overview of the whole room? No, we just started with a brief conversation and because you weren't here and Michelle had this great question about uh, looking for an example of how we were using data on a fabric in a simple way, I showed her the Tanganyika one, which was the first one that we worked on together. Because right. right. um, I talked about how the, as you go through the portraits, you can, each lake has a different story and even that's that sort of put together in a different kind of way. So, right. yeah. so you could go ahead to, okay. you can go ahead, Allison. Well, and that's a great view lake. right there where you can see all the variety of lakes and a lot of the underlying idea was to show the diversity and individuality of all these lakes at Gleon, if there was one refrain that always came back was, if you've seen one lake, you've seen one lake. And that really stuck with me in terms of thinking about how each lake is its own self with its own issues and its own uh, climactic issues, as well as, uh, you know, 
warming, you know, so our goal was to find, or for me, was to find the most diverse set of issues in the lakes and then approach each lake individually as a new project with new data, with new ideas and new research. So I would research history, lake lore, um, vintage photography, and then the data sets that the researchers would give me in order to make a portrait of each lake. So we're looking at a combination here. <clears throat> and the, the title of the, the installation is The Conference of the Lakes after Farida Tarr's epic poem, Sufi poem from 1100 uh, called The Conference of the Birds. And so I have done a whole body of work around the Conference of the Birds and the idea of the Conference of the Birds. And then when I was working with the lakes and I came back from Gleon, this conference of, uh, 210 people from 21 different countries, and they were all scientists, and then there was me. I thought these could be a conference of the lakes, and um, it made sense to me as well to kind of carry that theme to the lake work. And um, the storyline goes that the conference of the birds or the lakes you un unite to go on this epic journey to try to find the truth and the wisdom of the world and to try to solve the problems of the day. And so they go on this long, long, difficult journey. It's birds kind of drop out along the way. People get, uh, birds get frustrated, but then eventually they arrive where they are supposed to find the God, the truth, the wisdom at a, mo at a mountain lake. And so they're on the border of the mountain lake and they look into the water and they see their own reflection. So they're, they learn through this journey that the truth and the wisdom and the power was with them all along. And rather than searching outside yourself for solutions, often the solutions are inside ourselves. And so that laid, led me to creating actually in the exhibit, a mountain lake, which Tanya is gonna kind of wheel us towards through the panels. Um, so this is a glass lake. Uh, I, I got curious about the bathymetry of the lakes and what it would look like to see the underwater shapes of the lakes and what, the, what you couldn't see. A lot of what this project is about is making visible the invisible making the data and what the data signifies visible. So in this case, I'm making what you don't see of the lake visible by turning it inside out, if you will. So this is a um, Lake Zigadanus. It's a mountain lake and symbolically, it's the, the culmination of the journey of the whole conference of the lakes to this mountain lake. And it's kind of a word play because I've made it into a mountain, but it's a lake and it is a mountain lake because Lake Zigadanus is in Canada, Banff, uh, near Lake Louise. And so thus it shows kind of the undulations of the, the lake. <clears throat> Comments, questions? Alice, over what span of time um, has this uh, project um, taken place? Well, uh, I met Catherine in 2017 and that's when we first started talking about it. And then we've worked worked uh, th since then um, over the years, but we really pushed after Gleon, which was in fall uh, 2019. And so I, I started applying for artist residencies then because I knew I needed that focus. And I have to say, it, you know, it, at Flathead Lake, it was just the perfect place to push this project and to really work through and be isolated enough to find the time and the space and to do a project about lakes where I could hear a lake 24 seven from my cabin was just too good to be true. Honestly, it was just dreamy. So um, that's uh, Tanya's showing us um, Lake Zigadanus there. And Zigadanus, the word means the death flower. So I've integrated the death flower images of the death flower with um, the data that signifies the increasing turbidity. Um, right, Catherine, it's increasing. I, for some reason, that one I always get turned around about. But um, the turbidity, turbidity is increasing 
And um, the lake is actually losing blue. And the researcher that we collaborated with is actually looking at this lake in terms of how it used to be a milky blue, like a turquoisey blue that's referenced in the color that you see in the panel. Often I would eyedropper out color from lakes, whether it was from archival images of lakes of what colors they used to be, or lakes that, um, that are changing in more recent photographs. So this is actually a photograph of the water that the researcher took that I uh, made into these, um, into these patterns. So it kind of shows the way it's the lakes turn into a more deeper cobalt blue because there's not as much what they call flower in the lake um, from the glaciers. And so thus, and Catherine I'm sure could explain that better, but the flower in the lake is making it milky and it's now turning to, into this deep dark cobalt blue and losing its blue, so to speak. Um, so that's Lake Zigadenus. And at Flathead Lake, it was fun to actually take pictures of the water underwater when I was there. So here, the hot pink one here, the magenta, that's Lake Toval in Italy. And those are histogram data that's showing the clarity, depth clarity of the water. Um, and Lake Toval is quite famous for having had this bright, bright magenta algae in the 50s. And the algae has been disappearing over the years and they aren't really quite sure why, but the lake is renowned for this um, pink color. And now it's more of like a Caribbean greenish blue. Um, and so we're, we're gonna look at that panel there. This is um, warming data from Lake Toval using a more appropriate color to what the lake looks like today. So the lake is warming, the, it, the ice off dates are, are changing every year. Um, and uh, so that was working with um, kind of the idea of Lake Toval then and now. Um, and there's another picture in the space that can show you Lake Toval where I actually worked with the vintage photograph, but we can get there eventually. But um, these, this, what also interested me, this is Lake Otsego in New York. And um, it was fascinating to me that the scientific data, I rarely changed a color of the scientific data. I think in the Tanzanian lake, the first one I did, it was um, I not, I think that there wasn't color if I'm correct, or I shifted it a little bit, but, um, but I was fascinated in the colors that the scientists were using. And so in my field, as an artist, I feel form always follows function and there's always a reason or I try to come up with a reason for the colors that I use in my work. There's usually a conceptual underpinning as to why I'm using those colors. And in the science, interestingly, I was like, there's no reason that this is yellow, this is pink or this is purple other than it's just a different time. So that really fascinated me that the colors were really arbitrary. And so for me, they were the true colors, the true colors of the scientific data. So I didn't want to necessarily breach that truth. As we know, photography is never truth. But um, anyway, so that's kind of, I found those colors to be beautiful. And these um, high frequency data here, I, I, the patterns reminded me of, like Missoni fabric or uh, you know high fashion in a way, um, and those references interested me um, as well. So I have a question. It's interesting, um, you know, that these beautiful um, patterns are are extracted from data. And so Catherine or Tom, like when you see this um, these patterns as somebody who you know, reads and spends time with these graphs in, you know, kind of a, a functional situation. Like what, what happens for you? Can you, can you read these? Um, what happens when a scientist looks at these? I could totally let Tom answer that if he wants to wade in, but <laughs> that's a putting him on the spot a bit too. Um, you know, when I look, they don't look anything like the lake looks like to me. The data looks, has been interpreted very, very differently by, by Alice. And I think that's really cool. Um, it's a different way of looking at the same thing. 
Yeah, I think that if the if the the data were shown in the way that we're accustomed to seeing it, we could instantly provide you an interpretation of what that means for the ecological and the environmental conditions of the lake, right? But Alice didn't take our graphs and leave them like science graphs. She took the patterns that the data made and then used them in totally different ways. So, you know, like the one that Tanya is looking at right now, I just think Christmas lights every time I see this, but, you know, I also, you know, have, a, I know the story behind these particular data. So I kind of know a little bit what's going on, but if I just came up to this, I would be like, ooh, pretty. <laughs> So. A lot of the modus operandi is to try to uh, lure a viewer in and um, create uh, an emotive experience and uh, an immersive experience that's going to get the viewer to ask questions about why is this panel bright pink? Why am I looking at Lake Superior like this? We want to tell the stories in a different way that hopefully can widen the audiences and at the same time create empathy for the causes that these are representing. So I think it one in one sense, the panels and the lake portraits are celebratory of the lakes and of their differences and of all their unique qualities, but they're also um, you know, foreboding about the issues that all the lakes are facing. So that's it's kind of a double edged sword there that I want that cusp I want to play with. So um, so it needs the contextual information, if you will, to, to get deeper. So you want your visitors to ask questions. Yeah, and sort of speaking of that, you know, obviously these, these are data that have been, most of them have already been published in some kind of scientific paper. So it's not the first time someone's had a chance to see these data, but maybe not very many people read those papers. <laughs> so, which is why I wanted to collaborate with Alice. Um, and I will put in the chat just a link to a document that's also accessible if you're in the um, exhibition where you can see a little overview of the lakes and also a link to the scientific paper that the data came from. So if you did want to see what scientists do with these data, you could you could go look at look at some of those original papers to see and learn more too. So is the sound on Tanya? No. Mm -hmm. Maybe later we could turn it on or in the other I can room. turn it up here. So, cause I don't know if it'll be. So the wall where you see the photographs in the different sizes on the wall, those are kind of to help illustrate the source material of the patterns where they came. So they're more enlarged details of the patterns from the lake. Um, so that's what those are. And then on the far wall where you're seeing through to through the patterns, um, there's a wall of um, plants from the herbarium at the Flathead Lake Station. So they had this wonderful um, herbarium that I worked with and photographed all the different macrophytes and algae. And most of them date from the early 20th century. And it also fascinated me how a lot, some of them were even put on an odd receipt or I loved how they were taped down and the shapes and the colors. And so that was just beautiful um, to me. And so that's quite an extensive variety of the plants that I worked with at the station at Flathead Lake. Great. Alice, oh, uh, I have a question here from Hadley and then Michelle will get one from you. Um, uh, Alice, Hadley is wondering how uh, Flathead Lake was interpreted. Let's, we're gonna move that way. Good question, we're moving that way. Perfect. So Flathead Lake is, there are two panels that are more, uh, less abstract. And Flathead Lake is actually the panel, the first panel that's high in the back corner that all of this is flowing down from. So the installation I thought of as like a cascade of water or a flowing of water from the highest point in that gallery, which is quite high in that back corner, flowing down forward and curving around. So um, Tanya, if we move in on Flathead, you can see the peninsula on the lake where I lived, where my little cabin was right on the other side. And um, I took uh, underwater pictures of the lake to get the colors of the lake. And then I have bathymetry um, 
layered in with the data set that you can see here, which is all about the invasive species issue when mice's shrimp was introduced and it absolutely collapsed the salmon population and then by virtue of that, the eagle population. And um, so the mice's shrimp were very sneaky. They could go way deep in the water so that the salmon couldn't eat them and they'd hide down there and then the salmon couldn't find them. So they were introduced to feed the salmon to help the salmon, but they did the opposite. So it's a lot about how you shift one tiny thing and all, how that has repercussions across the food web, for example. So this is Flathead Lake. Um, it's a, if you pull back, Tanya, you can see more of the color, um, which is actually greener. Um, and so there's the peninsula with the data and the bathymetry. And there's another picture of Flathead on the other wall as well. But while we're here to the left, we're at, um, we're in Iceland. Uh, this is uh, Lake Blavatn, which is a, a lake that has become bigger and larger because the uh, glacier became extinct. They actually had a a celebra not a celebration, but they had a, a commemoration of the glacier when it went extinct and then this lake happened. And so that's satellite data that shows the size of the lake and the size of the glacier and how that's changing. So again, often the underlining themes of all these lakes are about change, um, how things are changing. Uh, and then I also played with the vintage poster idea. I think a lot about how we romanticize lakes. We romanticize the culture around lakes, the recreation. We do the po uh, posters like of Lake Tahoe, which you'll see in a moment as well. Um, so I used this vintage poster of the two women and it's such a cliche that of course the women are the ones that are chatting and it's the perfect place for gossiping so that's what that poster reveals. And then I, I took actually some pictures of the mountains that's also layered in there because I had a layover once in um, Iceland or actually twice. So I had some of my old pictures from Iceland, which that poster is one of them and the mountains as well. And we have a nut, right? We could go to Thingvallavatn, which is the other Icelandic lake here. And the ice off data is shifting so much. This is warming data. Um, and the lake is not consistently freezing over anymore. And so much of the culture is built around the lake and the activities of skating and ice fishing, et cetera. So I used um, an old, old vintage pictures from the 1920s of people skating on the lake. And now they don't consistently and are not able to skate on the lake. And the other thing that has changed is this um, thing called finger rafting, which is where the two ice pieces butt up against each other and create this geometric shape, which is really unusual and totally natural. So for me, that was really curious that something so organic and natural as ice on a lake could take a form that was so geometric. Um, and it puzzled them because they didn't know why it was all of a sudden happening. Alice, thank oh. you. Um, I want to jump in and Michelle, do you remember, we have a, a question here from Crackle, but I want Michelle to ask her question first, if you still remember it. I do. <laughs> Thanks, Tony. Hi. Uh, so this question is actually for Alice and, and, and Tom, and it's kind of Dev's tales with your talking about Flathead. And I'm just really interested in your interactions with all the different scientists. And I was wondering like what your experience every day, like what your daily experience was like at Flathead or you know, if you worked with a particular project or researcher um, and maybe some unexpected events that either the science or the art side had from interacting together. So thank you. Well, um, I guess you could say, you know, it was a perfect project for a pandemic in that it, it enabled a lot of armchair travel. Um, I have friends who are like 
damn, you went to Lake, you know, by call and you didn't tell me or I didn't get to come with you. I'm like, no, I didn't go there. So it was a lot of uh, long distance correspondence and Zooms and meetings with researchers from around the world um, at Flathead. And so at Flathead, my day was walking on the beach or thinking and looking out at the water, hearing the water and then getting to work. And then I worked all day. And, uh, and with the bears, you know, I just didn't walk outside a lot at night. So <laughs> I became a big bear fan. And I, then I realized, Sony told me it's actually named Bear Dance, the town, or which I never saw that town. But um, anyway, long and short, I saw nine bears that I'm very happy with. But, um, but I loved being there. I can't tell you how much I love being there and being able to focus. Because in my day-to-day -day life, I don't have that kind of quiet solitude. I've never had that kind of quiet solitude as I experienced at Flathead. There was only one other artist there. Um, and then I did go back and forth to the lab to meet with, um, for example, Monica and Jim and Tom and, um, and Cody. Uh, so, and um, Diane Whitehead was helpful to me in creating the, um, getting bathymetry for me. And so she was instrumental in creating the 3D work. And um, yeah, so I, yeah. And then we, we experienced every uh, season there. That was beautiful. When I got there, I was able to swim in the lake. We kayaked in the lake. We experienced fall. And then we experienced winter with these huge snowstorms. I mean, crazy huge. And the, you know, the snow on our roofs and on the trees and then the wind. And there's a video of actually a kind of mesmerizing view of um, the trees at Flathead that's over here. And I also want to point out here's at the end of the installation, I wanted to have something that kind of came to life at the end. And so there are these two videos that were made um, thanks to Monica of the zooplankton. And um, so this is uh, of the Z a Daphnia. This is uh, Daphnia, pink Daphnia. So it's just on a loop and moving and you can get in close and you can see the heart beating and the eye twirling and the, you know, it's just, I fell in love with these little guys and I just thought they were beautiful. And so I, I also loved having them on these small screens animating the back of the room. And this Daphnia was giving birth to these eggs while we were filming. And uh, the, the person who was working with us, not Monica, um, she thought that they were giving birth to these eggs and we were all excited, et cetera, et cetera. And then Jim, Elser walked in and said, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but actually she, those eggs aren't, are not, uh, she's ex expelling the eggs because they're not viable. And so we're like, oh, okay. So, so she's actually ex uh, executing her choice. So it got me thinking, of course, my political self was thinking, well, if the Daphnia can choose, why can't we choose? You know, it's just like crazy. And so she's, you know, choosing to not have those eggs. And here you can see you can't see very well, but um, it goes back and forth. It's just like this mesmerizing video that almost looks stationary, but the trees are blowing and you hear, you hear birds, you hear the wind. It just, I couldn't, often I would stare up at the trees and just listen and look. I did a lot of sound recording there too, which is incorporated in the sound element. And eventually it just goes back and forth to several views of trees and then the egg finally drops. And so those, that's, those videos are at, at the Flathead Lake Biological Station, right? Yes. And I, I recall walking around the grounds with Tom um, one time and looking at those trees and then, oh, what wonderful trees. And Tom remarking something about what, what kind of um, life-sucking uh, parasite is living on those trees, Tom? mistletoe they're all badly infested with a epiphytic parasite that taps into their xylem and phloem and feeds off of them so they are cool they kind of look like pom-poms or some people call it witch's broom but uh, they are cool to look at but they are a sign of poor forest health mm -hmm. um, that's yeah. good for another project i think that sounds like fodder for another project the trees so um so Alice, can I ask, uh, Crackle uh, shared a question. Is it okay if I ask her a question? Of course, hi Crackle. 
so she says uh, she's curious if with such provocative work that acknowledges the human impact on our world, if you feel like you would want to extend your work to give viewers actionable steps going forward. Uh, she says, I find it so overwhelming, all the grief and overwhelming climate change. I am looking to give hope and actions. Just wondering if that comes into your thinking. That's an excellent question and, so, and something that I, I think about all the time. And um, with the bird work, um, the conference of the bird work that I collaborated with the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, that my work, my, my, my whole thinking is I want to put the work to work. So with the bird work, I was using the bird calls for collision prevention and raising money for the birds. And then I did the fashion project as well, um, where the bird calls were printed on fabric. I have it in here. And so with this fashion designer out of Paris, we made these garments. She found my work on the internet. And so we made, we raised a lot of money for the birds and it went directly. I agreed to do it as long as all the profits went directly to the birds. So I do want to put the work to work in any way I can. And so I need to get back to her about doing lake dresses because I think those would be awesome. And I can think of uh, that being, or scarves or with some of the patterns would be really beautiful and other ways of raising funds. It's, I mean, there's, there's, it is overwhelming what can be done, you know, but a lot of it is, I think, donating it to the groups that are on the ground and are actionable doing the hard labor on the ground, if you will. Um, like places like the Cornell Lab uh, or the American Bird Association. And um, yeah. Or so actually biological station. Exactly, exactly. Right. Thank you. Of course. And Gleon. So, you know, we could, we could put this work to work raising funds um, for organizations that are working to protect the waters, which is hugely, obviously important. So um, we are in a different room now, um, an adjacent room where I did a body of work tracing Audubon. And um, I had a residency in uh, Key West last year as well, and I was tracing the 22 original species that Audubon illustrated in his 1832 portfolio. And I wanted to kind of capture the feeling of looking for these birds in the wild. So these are pictures that I took at dawn, looking out at the landscapes, searching for these birds, trying to find the species that I knew were there through the, that portfolio in 1832. And um, so they're the landscapes where the birds are often hidden in the back. And when they were brought up to scale to uh, 50 inches or so, I found birds and even Tanya mentioned finding mystery birds or was that, I think it was Lisa actually found mystery birds that she didn't even see before. And I too, when I printed it, I was like, oh, there's another one that I hadn't been able to see otherwise. Um, so that's a great blue heron. And the pink wall is the uh, sound wave patterns. This is how I mostly work with birds is I photograph the sound wave patterns of their bird calls. So this is the roseate spoonbill. And I use the color of the bird. This bird is hot pink and beautiful and looks prehistoric in a way. Here's the roseate spoonbill. It has the pink that we're looking at. And so I want to use color as advocacy. So I use the color of the bird. So that color kind of becomes a voice for the bird. And the roseate spoonbill, uh, because of environmental shifts and the ra raising waters in South Florida, they're not finding the nesting grounds where they usually are in the Everglades. So they've been pushing north all the way to even different states because they can't nest in Florida like they used to. So there's been a big movement to work with the roseate spoonbill. And that's an anhinga in the picture there. So I just wanted to create that juxtaposition of color too between the deep, deep greens and then the, and the birds. 
and the landscapes and that feeling of being in that space, which was a landscape that was quite foreign to me. You know, when you have binoculars or your camera and you're looking for things and looking up and then you think, oh my God, there could be a python or an alligator right there at my feet, you know. It was wonderful to work there though, you know. It wasn't the bears there, it was the alligators and the python, so. <laughs> Uh, Alice, uh, uh, so there's an audio component to this one, right? To both rooms, there's both an audio rooms. piece, yeah. And, and we'll have those audio pieces at the exhibit here in Missoula, is that right? We'll have access? You'll have the one, the Lake Project. The Lake audio. Project. So I'll, I'll go ahead and make a plug just so you guys know we have an opening uh, next Friday, first Friday from 5 to 9 p.m. at uh, Gallery 709 in Missoula on at 709 Ronan if you're in Missoula or the Missoula area. And um, Alice, one of her works, it's not a, it's not a big piece, but it's a, it's a nice print um, that has slices of different lakes so you can study the lines up close and then also a, a link. Uh, we'll, we'll get to see the Daphnia um, in video as long as technology cooperates and then um, there'll be a link to the audio works for the lakes. So hope you can join us in that exhibit will be up for a month. So um, you can pop by at any time they're open. Uh, so this what we're looking at is the uh, is the pink flamingo. So the, that's a flamingo totem. So it's the bird calls of the flamingo. And that's kind of enter, it's the first piece you see as you walk in the gallery other than the straight ahead wallpaper. Um, so again, playing with these colors of the birds and the landscapes, the complementary colors of the hot pink and the green. Um, Can you hear the audio? So the I, I'm just curious because I have my my microphone on. I was okay. just yeah, we can only hear the audio when you're the person when when nobody else is talking, I guess. Because okay. all the sound has to come from your Okay. So the audio has the 20 uh uh, the original birds, the 22 original species from archives from the Cornell lab. And some of the archives are from even the 50s from the founder of the Cornell lab, Alan, um, uh, Arthur Allen. So um, I, love he I love hearing the calls, compiling them together into these sound pieces is just really extraordinary. And then the lake sound pieces is much more eclectic. There's a lot of different components in the lake sound piece. This is all uh, archives of birds from the Cornell lab. And the lake, we hear researchers um, to kind of underline the international nature of the project. We hear researchers from Russia, from Iceland, from France, from uh, Italy, uh, we, all sorts of languages. So we have South American, no, we didn't get the South American person, but anyway, we're, we are um, trying to underline that, inter you know, and so we hear the researchers speak about the lakes in their own voice, which is really beautiful in their own language. And then there are other, there's a, a writer <coughs> who's reading um, from her book about Lake Superior, these beautiful phrases. Um, there's uh, a Tanzanian rap song mixed in, there are birds mixed in. Um, there's uh, also a news clip about an event that happened on Lake Michigan, and and there's all and then there's the Baikal. This is Lake Baikal, the largest lake in the world in Russia. It's in Siberia, and the the uh, babushka of Baikal has gone absolutely viral on the internet. And then Baikal has been written about in the New York Times, I think, three times since big cover-ish stories since this exhibit went up, all the Russians are flooding to Baikal in the pandemic. Um, but this is the other end of the conference that also has a more figurative image. So when you back out, um, you can see the uh, archived picture um, of the landscape of the lake. You might not be able to see it so well with the backlight as it is right now. May, if you back way out, I think we can see it. So that's um, 
Lake Baikal. And we see a pink lake in the background there. That's um, a lake in Australia. My goal was to really get at least a lake per continent. We could look at Abiata. I think that's an interesting story. I don't know where we are on time, but there are lakes that are shrinking. There are lakes that are growing. Um, yes. Lake Tahoe that's losing its famous clarity. That's Lake Abiata in Ethiopia. Um, and the lake is shrinking due to drought. The, there's a lot of habitat loss for waterfowl and these concentric circle lines are just happen to also be almost in the shape of Africa but the the size of the lake is just shrinking and these lines to de delineate that shrinkage and then we have new growing lakes from uh, from glaciers we in Chile this is mercury there's blue green algae there's phenological whiplash El Morado from Chile, a growing lake from a glacier. So the black outline is uh, what the what, where the ice and water originally was, and the furthest outline is the largest uh, that the lake is. So El Morado in Chile. So and maybe a quick peek at um, Tahoe, and we might be good. Yeah, we have about we have about eight minutes um, remaining, and uh, uh, so just want to invite folks in for any questions or comments that that they have that haven't been come up yet. So that's the Seki data of how the lake is um, losing its clarity and a detail of a vintage poster like I was talking about previously. And um, we could look at the uh, magenta lake on the wall on the back if you want. And then there's another picture of Flathead. Here's uh, a vintage picture of the magenta algae in Italy at Lake Toval. So I was also, these are kind of studies that got me going. So the, the piece that will be in the show in Missoula is um, kind of like test strips from the lake. It's like a study of the different um, patterns as they started growing and uh, how they played off of each other. And then uh, to the right, Tanya, is the Flathead Lake bathymetry lines overlaid again over that picture of the lake and the peninsula. Okay, I'll be quiet now. So questions, comments. It's important to me that the lakes dialogue with each other through that transparency. That's part of why I chose the transparency is to kind of also underlie or show how a lot of the lakes have similar issues and problems and that they are all together as one as well as separate. Uh, Alice, I have, I think this is more of a comment than anything, but just thinking about um, this nexus of like, how, how do you, how does one come to know a lake? And I think this is bringing in the scientists that are here and, and thinking about, thinking about this idea of representation um, and thinking about the idea of being in place and experiencing, um, you know, the lake as a kind of a lived experience and then also thinking about the, the researchers that are here and the the way that you know the lake and understand it in this whole other way and so um, it's just interesting this confluence um, of of ways of knowing and I'm, I'm I, there's not really a question it's just a, a thing a stone to turn over well and then each one was a way of knowing differently right. too. So that that lake, I photographed the, the, the trees on the edge of the lake. So it's kind of almost like a, a silhouette of the trees looking out at the lake. It, it, there are so many ways of knowing something, right? So- um, And at different periods of time too. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd weigh in that kind of scientifically, the getting to know a lake is a never ending thing. And I've been working at Flathead Lake since 1996. And 
I had a long in-depth conversation yesterday with one of our faculty members and I learned all kinds of new things about Flathead Lake yesterday. And so it isn't a static thing at all. And, you know, both Tony and Alice said, you know, we are getting a snapshot in time of this particular place, but the lake is constantly evolving. It's a dynamic thing, as is our understanding and our relationship to it. Additionally, you know, I have a personal relationship to Flathead Lake that is very different than my scientific relationship to the lake. And so um, it's, it's beautifully complicated and it's always changing and we're always discovering new things. And I love that as a person, kind of my general curiosity, but professionally and scientifically, that's the whole goal. You're always looking to discover what's going on in a, in my case, in the waters that I study. And uh, sometimes you're surprised and sometimes you're not, and sometimes you're totally wrong. And that might be the most fun of all of it is when you think something is happening and the data or another scientist or the, the ecosystem or the lake just flat out proves you wrong. And, and uh, if, if you go in thinking you know everything, you, you usually get um, knocked back pretty quickly in the world of scientific inquiry. Wonderful point. Yeah, I love that. The, the dynamic aspect of the lake and the knowledge parallel to each other. And that's like what Tom was just saying is why I think, you know, science and art coming together is like such a perfect merger in so many ways, because to be a good scientist, you have to be open minded and you have to be creative and you have to be able to explore new ways of thinking about the data or looking at the data, or, you know, and, and be able to imagine that the lake is trying to tell you something different than maybe what you expected it to. So just in the same ways that Alice is so incredibly creative about her work, I feel like good scientists also are creative. We're just looking at this from a different perspective. Um, yeah. So we just have like two minutes remaining and I wanna respect everyone's time at the lunch hour on a Friday. Um, I, I do wanna draw your attention and this is a bit of a follow-up I believe to Crackle's question earlier. Tanya dropped a couple of links into the chat um, uh, and one points to um, the, uh, the exhibit page listed at Illinois State University galleries. Um, and I will follow up too with an email to you with the resources that we've listed in the chat. Um, but there, Alice has a whole bunch of really wonderful resources that are listed, readings and educational resources. And so I really, if you're, if you're interested in this, um, if you want, if you want more, that's a great place to start. Um, and then also Alice, if I, I don't want to speak for you, but I imagine she's so wonderfully approachable. If you want to continue having conversations with Alice, I'm sure she'd be delighted to um, correspond with you as well. Absolutely. And this is an ongoing project. We're still uh, working on new lakes, different lakes. We're still, extent, you know, it's a growing project. And uh, speaking of that link on the website, there's also a lot of pictures. There's a video, there's other resources there, but there are actionable places there there's the, the video, um, Kiss the Ground. I think it's essential watching and you can get involved with things like that or Mission Blue, which is for the oceans and you can get involved with that. So I think there's so many places out there that need help and need to people to get involved with. So there's no, well, no shortage. Absolutely. And I, and I want to, as a, as a, uh, near and dear partner to our hearts. I also want to plug again the Flathead Lake Biological Station, which are wonderful stewards of uh, the largest, you know, freshwater body, uh, um, what, east, west of the Mississippi. And we just have a very special um, lake right in our backyard for those of us who live here in Montana. And they've done such a wonderful job of stewarding that area. And so if you're not familiar with the work that they do, I recommend I also put their link in here. And then I dropped a link to open air for those of you who are interested in you know, more conversations about this and place-based work. So um, any last comments, uh, Tanya or Alice before we part ways here? Comments, questions, other questions. I, I haven't been looking at too much at the chat here. I've I've kept I've you. Think... We've got all the questions answered. Okay, good. Yeah. Good. 
Um, and I will, I will send everybody a link to this recording. Feel free to share it with anybody you think may be interested. And again, and again, I'll send uh, links to everything um, and ways to follow up with Alice, with Tanya and uh, Tom. And uh, thank you everyone so much for being here and taking the time to uh, connect and Alice for your great work. It's so wonderful to see this exhibition up and honored in such a beautiful space. Um, I personally have a special space in my heart for Illinois State University. It was my alma mater for my graduate work. And so it's wonderful the crossovers that have occurred with this exhibition. Um, so. Alice, any last words from you? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's so nice to see you, Tom. I thank you again for the amazing stay on Flathead and to Stoney for the opportunity. Uh, it was, I couldn't have done this without that for sure. So thank you. Um, and nice to see everyone. Thanks for taking time to uh, be interested in the work. Okay. Wonderful. Take care, everyone. Thank you for coming, and we'll look forward to connecting with you in the near future. Okay. Bye. Bye.